we're going to move forward with our agenda. Um, we're actually, we will come back to the research recommendation question, but that's going to be part of um, the discussion for our next agenda item. So we'll move into that. I'll introduce Katie Drew, our stock assessment scientist for ASMFC, from ASMFC for Northern Trent. And she will be first assess, discussing the quota setting process. The, the quota setting process is really an outgrowth of the CSA model and how the model and the model results. So let's jump right into it. <clears throat> the shrimp FMP specifies a target F for management. So we want to meet this F rate. So basically we want to take out a certain amount of the, a certain proportion of the population every year that we think is sustainable, but also gives a good harvest for uh, the fishery. And we calculate a quota based on this rate from the assessment results. So we need the number of fishable shrimp basically in the summer of the fishing year, um, and then, or the, the summer before the fishing year starts, and then the target of the benchmark F to be attained. And both of those um, come out of the assessment model. So as we were saying, the benchmark, this target F is a historical proxy. So basically we looked at a stable period in the fishery where from 1985 to 1994, which is this red box here. And that's, you can see the gray is biomass and the black line is the fishing mortality rate. So we, during this period, though we feel the fishery was, was pretty stable in terms of both the landings, but also more importantly, in terms of F and in terms of biomass. So it fluctuates a little, but it's not jumping up and down like you see later in the time series. So the average F for this period is our, is our target. So the CSA model estimates F in each year for this stable period, as well as for all the other years in the model. And it estimates the number of fishable shrimp for all the years in the model, including the last year of the model. So basically we just apply this target F to our estimate of fishable shrimp, which gives you the catch in number of, of shrimp that will achieve this target F. So this is the number of shrimp you need to take out of the population to meet your target F, target F rate. And then you convert the number of shrimp to metric tons based on the average weight of the shrimp in the catch that you're expecting based on sampling from the summer survey and also sort of our idea of, or our understanding of how that summer survey size structure translates into catch the next year based on historical data. So this is, that's basically it. And the NSTC presents possible quota levels to the section based on the assessment results. And we present a whole suite of options. We include uh, the amount of quota that you need to achieve your target F rate and your threshold F rate. So that target is a little bit of a buffer below your um, threshold F rate, which would be considered overfishing. Um, your, we present alternative F values all the way down from very small amounts to really large amounts of F. What quota do you get for those? as well as alternatives based on the average po possible average size of the shrimp in the catch. So we base sort of our best guess on conditions that we see in the summer survey and what that relates to and what we've seen historically in that next year's catch. And that's sort of our best average size. But it could be a little smaller or a little bigger depending on how these year classes or, or stage classes really move through the fishery. So we present a quota for if you've got a really low average weight or quota versus a high average weight in the catch. And then this entire suite of options is presented to the section and the section chooses a final quota based on their management objectives and based on input from stakeholders. So that is essentially the quota setting process in a nutshell. And so it's very, it's really straightforward. It's very, it's based on the results of the stock assessment model as well as uh, input from management. So, who has questions? Um, the basis of this is the stable period. Mm -hmm. um, and the F that, was, that came out of the generator was stable period. And this assumption is based on accurate planning, catch rates, not catch rates, volume, right? Between 1985 and 1995, record keeping landing in the state very bad. Um, I know I was buying the majority of the shrimp there. The only thing I know is the amount of shrimp that I bought, right? I have a pretty good idea what the other guys were doing, but I know the amount of shrimp I bought. Based on the figures that we're using for this, uh, through that period, I would have bought over 80% of the shrimp landed. 
did not happen. We grossly underestimated the amount of shrimp this land. So this basic assumption that we're, we're, we're going forward here and saying that, you know, 4,000 tons was the average during the stable period, this is our target. Um, to me, being involved in it, knowing what I bought, is not realistic. Um, and it's the basis of what we do. So I guess my question is, is how is this vetted? Um, it, was it, you know, was there consideration taken into the fact that reporting was very bad during this period? Um, and then what do we do uh, to adjust for that? So have we, did we do sensitivity runs with assuming that the catch was underreported for these time periods? Maggie's nodding yes here. So, I mean, that's definitely a concern, and I think that's a concern, and, and basically any species that are precision and how well we know the catch has definitely improved over time. But the, the issue here is, is that uh, this, taking a historical uh, perspective, uh, setting uh, current processes um, is, I mean, there's very little precedent for that, especially when you have the data that's being put into that in question. So no matter you know how many retrospective shots you take of this, I don't think it's it's answering the key problem is that what was going on during the state period. So part of I think we'll get it we'll touch on this a little bit when we get into future work because I think that is something that we want to look at in the future, which is that um, yes, there's issues with how this how with the data that go into this. And it's not perfect. There's, to a certain extent, we're looking at we're looking at F rates. So if you're taking a lot more out, then the model is going to say, and if we adjust for that, then the model is going to say, well, there there were more fish. So your overall F rate may not change that much for this average time period. This is if, if, if you assume that you're taking four thousand tons when actually you were taking seven thousand tons or eight thousand tons, it would completely change where you are what, and what your F was. And so if your F at that point was not at what we thought was 2.7 or 0.27, but it was really 0.4, we would be looking at a completely different picture now. It's not, you know, to the, I, you know, I understand what you're saying about, it, you know, uh, being relative. If we had, you know, 30,000 tons um, and, uh, you know, an F of, uh, 2.7, we change the national mortality, um, and uh, we produce more with more fish, right? Then we're going to drop the F down to meet that landing projection that this stable period was based on. So we're, we're dumbing everything down for 4,000 tons. We're backing into this. We aren't looking forward. We're backing into a space on what we think happened, and we know what we think happened didn't happen. So for us, who have been, you know, we, this is nothing new. This has been an issue for years. Um, I guess, you know, I'm looking for an answer of, you know, how do you justify that? How do you justify using questionable data to be the basis of your decision making today? So, did you want to address this or do you have a second a question? I want to address this. As a scientist, aren't you obligated to work with the best data available? Isn't that not what you did? And not to contradict Spencer, but his assumptions or statements that you may have been more fraud or less fraud, unless you have that as scientific data, you can't use that in your reasoning and applications with the models on the table. I think, I think Spencer has a valid point. I mean, it's certainly something to be concerned about. And I'd like to recommend that we have that as a tool for the next, you know, for the next benchmark that we study that in depth. Um, I've been concerned about the same thing because in 01, we stopped using the other reports and we started using mandatory harvester reports. So probably our land use data are much more complete now than they used to be. We, we don't know how much. Have your own opinion about that. Um, I did have quite a conversation with Marilyn Lash, who uh, used to be a NIMP support agent in Rockland, who was responsible for collecting all these landings data back in the 80s and 90s. 
because then how did you do it? You know, what was the process? And she said, you know, we would get a list of all the licensed dealers from the state and call them. Did you buy shrimp? Are you buying shrimp? We send them forms to fill out. If they didn't send us back the form, we called them. And she said, we, we did a pretty thorough job, at least you know, we were legally licensed to buy shrimp. She said, we, we had good coverage. Now, it didn't include the federal stuff, which, as you know, we talked about, has always been a problem. But, but if you were buying legally, she felt that they did a really good job of, of capturing that. So, so I don't know where we can go with this. You know, it's, it's what we've got. We did do some sensitivity analyses last winter on what would happen if we had underestimated those lines, or you know, would it change things? We tried running it, just jacking all those earlier landings up by 10%. It didn't really make a whole lot of difference. If you jacked them up by about 25%, it did start to change, to change where we are relative to where we were. So I think that needs some more work, but I don't know that we're ever going to be able to answer that. I mean, you know. Uh it's not, I'm presenting what I know because I know what I bought per pound. So it's, I'm not trying to put forward any anecdotal information. And I also know uh, a bit about the reporting strategies during those times when people have to buy from. And, uh, you know, so for me, there's just a huge, huge uh, disconnect. Now, I don't know if it got, you know, if it got better as we ramped up there in the, in the mid uh, 90s. Um, but I know that from 85 to 92, it was, it was you know, pretty sketchy. So, um, as I say, it's only, I know what I bought. I know it was reported to be landed. And uh, we bought a lot of shrimp, but I didn't buy that high percentage of shrimp. And, and absolutely, I don't think, right, I don't think we're trying to brush this off as though that's insignificant or that it's not a concern of the, of the TC. And one of the things we definitely want to do for the next assessment is alternative reference points. So this is a reference point we use now because it's we have what looks like a stable period in the fishery. And it's true that the method we're using now may not maximize production. So that we give you, we can provide a stable quota based on this period. But you're right, we may be underestimating it based on the performance of the fishery in the past. And so what we perceive as stable from the data that we have and the model that we have may actually be an underestimate of what is stable during this period and what might maximize production in the future. So, but the flip side of that is we don't have right now an alternative. The CSA model does not provide reference points the way, for example, ASAP or a statistical catch at age model produces, ref <coughs> excuse me, produces reference points for other fisheries that you may be familiar with. So CSA needs an external reference point calculation to, to manage against. And at the time, this is, this is the best available data that we had and the best available approach to produce a stable quota. In the future, as we go forward, I think we absolutely want to look at things like um, reference points based on the life history and the biology of the species. But I think we also want to keep in mind the fact that um, we have seen these big spikes and these big in catch and then followed by a drop in biomass. So we want to be able to, when we go forward, check our estimates of production against what we've seen historically in the past. Now, understanding, of course, that these data have uncertainty around them. And unfortunately, the survey, at least, we can get an actual mathematical estimate of the uncertainty around, those around each year's index based on the way the survey is designed. We know what the point value is, but we know how certain we are about that point value. And some years, we're more certain than we are others. But for catch, we're relying on essentially a census, and we don't have a good estimate of how, of how people are underreporting, if they're misreporting, if they're, what has happened in the past to, be, to, make, to add uncertainty to these numbers. So a lot of that is going to, we're going to have to rely on sort of on, on industry perception of how reporting behavior was back then and other things to get an idea of. Are we underestimating this by 10% or 20% or are we talking more 50 or 60%? Is there any, the, the big spike there, is there any relationship between that and any changes that were made in the way that you report? No, gee, is there anything change as far as the reporting goes 
caused that big spike? I mean, I mean, did reporting get better during that time frame? No, it got, I mean, the, I, we believe, I think there's been sort of gradual improvements over reporting over the entire time series as people, I think, take this more seriously and understand how these data are being used and as we're more aggressive with reporting requirements that the data have improved. But you know that that- But is this is not related to a change in management or um, a, a change in requirements or- It's more a change in the fleet sort of leaving ground fish and moving into shrimp uh, in those years of the, you know, the fleet and the effort really increased in those years. And the big drop would have been the days, that was when they started restricting days fishing the, the black line is fishing mortality, that right. heavy black line. Right, so this is not actually, so this isn't landing. This is actually what the model is estimating you were, sort of what proportion you were taking out. And that's so why you, fishing. so it's, right, I, I, do we have, I don't have a slide on landings in this one, um, but we can. Fishing mortality, right? right, so that's the rate. So what proportion are you taking out, not what land, not what the landings are? Because if you take 50,000 metric, is it, 5,000 metric tons out of a stock that's 10,000 metric tons is a much higher fishing mortality rate than if you take 5,000 metric tons out of a stock that's 50,000 metric tons. So this is sort of what the model has estimated the actual rate of removals was, not landings. It's usually related to landings, but not only. There's a question about what are other reference point options for F other than this historical proxy? There are a number of options. So and they they have different biologic. There's different data requirements for all of them. So we actually the for this go round the, the section tasked the TC to look at some of these options and are we ready to implement them now or what kind of additional data do we need? So I can sort of recite this off the top of our of our heads here. But one option would be to use ASPIC and to use a MSY value out of ASPIC. We don't believe that's a good option at all, based on sort of the reasons that we've already talked about, about why ASPIC has a hard time coming to the actual correct number, and why it's based on sort of assumptions about recruitment and stock size that we know are wrong. That is, ASPIC assumes that given one production, one stock level, you'll always have the same amount of recruits, and we know it's actually more environmentally driven. So we think that's not the best way to go. Um, we can look at it for comparison purposes. But in terms of other options, so I don't know if you're familiar with SPR-based reference points or yield per recruit or spawner per recruit reference points. Those are used in some of our fisheries. You'll see them as F20% or F40%. And the idea behind that is, so you sort of, let's say you have a stock and it's at a virgin condition. So you know if you fished on, if you fished on that, um, you would obviously bring that fishing, that stock size down. And the question for spawner per recruit relationships is if you, for a given F rate, how much are you gonna reduce that population size from the virgin spawning stock biomass? It's not based on, you don't need to know a stock recruit relationship because you basically just track sort of one unit of stock over time, applying this fishing rate to it. It declines over time. And you pick a point where you say, this is too, this is too low. We don't want to get below this point this much. We don't want to have less than 40% or less than 20% of the original spawning stock biomass left at the end. Um, so that's spawning stock biomass per recruit. So we don't necessarily need to know. It doesn't tell you anything about biomass because you don't know how many recruits you have, but you know for each individual recruit, how much are they going to contribute to the spawning stock population um, after you fish on it? We could actually, we could seriously do a whole four hour workshop on reference points alone. So I'm probably going a little too fast here, but I just want to get some of these terms out. Um, and so some of the benefits and some of the downsides of, of these reference points. And so that's, that one is used in some of our fisheries. Um, it's, it's a little hard to, the problem is it's hard to know, do you stop at 40%? Do you stop at 20%? What's the range in there? It's been based sort of on, well, these numbers have worked for other species, so we'll pick this. 40% if we don't have any other information. Right now, the F that we use um, in for the based on the historical proxy is about a 50, close to 50% SPR. If you, or, yeah, it's so, and it's very sensitive to assumptions about your total natural mortality rate. Basically, the higher your natural mortality rate is, the more you can take out of that, the 
the reference point says, the model says, you need to take those fish out or those shrimp out before everything eats them. So it's that the higher natural mortality is, the higher your reference point will be. But the problem is without that connection back to spawning stock size, you can run into trouble with not leaving enough left in the stock to replenish itself. Because these models just assume you're going to have another set of recruits coming through. That the, the upside is you don't have to have a spawner per recruit relationship. So you don't have to say this much spawning stock gives us this much recruits in the future. But you run the risk of not knowing where to where you want to keep your spawning stock size. So as they're saying, we're around an SPR of about 40% with the um, with the reference point that we have now, which is high compared to some of our species. Um, I know, for example, I'm just off the top of my head, spotted sea trout in the South Atlantic, they measure, they manage for an SPR of about 20%. And they can do that because the cyanids are very fast growers. They reproduce a lot. They, they mature in a couple of years. They end up big and heavy, and they produce uh, a lot of biomass. Whereas something with northern shrimp, you're talking about the bottom of the food chain here. So there's a lot of pressure of external sources on these shrimp. And that's something to keep in mind. Do we need to leave more in the in the stock to support other fisheries? Yeah, but again, this, this comes around driven by, or largely driven by, uh, by animals. So if, if your M's 0.6 and your rep based on your historical proxy is 0 0.08, I mean, it's minuscule. So, and that's, but here's the thing, the stable period, the other part of the reason we use the stable period is because it's not sensitive to assumptions about M. So if you do SPR, you're going to, and you say the M is 0.25, you will get a much lower value than if you say the M is, is higher than that. But with the CSA model, when we bump up the M, the population, but we're still taking that same amount of fish out, shellfish out. The model says, well, there must, if so many of these guys are dying because of natural mortality, there must have been a much larger population size. So you get a much smaller F. F is contributing to much lower values. And then when you multiply that out, the quota comes out to be very similar because you have, it's, you have a much lower F, but you have a much bigger population. With a low M, you have a smaller population, but a higher F during the stable period. That's because. That, that's, that's because you reduce uh, your F in proportion to what it was prior to raising your M. It's, it's, it's dependent, you know. It's they're, they're linked very closely because the model can't, you can't, we can't estimate natural mortality from this model. We need to, we're estimating total mortality. Right, so. And so we attribute some of it to fishing mortality and some of it to natural mortality. Right, so you get, so to main, maintain the same assumptions, uh, you end up with a point Zero eight fishing mortality. Yes. Um, any other fishery you know that's managed to point zero eight? I can't think of any off the top of my head. Any any other fishery managed close to point zero eight? But that's not. I can't either. So. Well, we have fisheries really <laughs> managed at zero, but the that, I no, mean. Wait a minute. No, wait. no. So the. That, come on. But I think the and you're right. I think this is why we need to examine what's going on with the model and with and and with the data that are going into the model. It's part of the reason we went with the, the, this historical proxy is it's not as sensitive to assumptions about M, which we do have a hard time getting a handle on. So with this model, with this reference point, we end up with a quota that's about the same and is not as, as dependent on our assumptions about what's actually going on with the biology of the species. So when we go forward with developing alternative reference points, we're gonna have to pay attention to uh, be very careful about what we're assuming about natural mortality and how that's going to line up with what we've seen in the fishery in the past. Now, the it's true that it's a very low value, and I'm not saying that that's the right answer. That 0.08 is is the right target for an absolute level. There's probably it's probably a middle ground between what's well. I don't want to speculate on that, but the the issue is is more. Yeah. I know I understand where you're going here, but let me just tell you where we're coming from and the sensitivity here. Okay, we're we're dealing with a couple of hundred tons. Here. I mean, uh, a 
go, go, no go. You know, and you put it in perspective. And do you see why we we lose a disconnect? That it just does not make any logical sense based on really what we know. That you know, and, and right now we as an industry are faced with punitive damages for going over, say, two hundred tons. A proposal of 125 percent, you know. So, please understand what we're dealing with as an industry. No, absolutely. Okay? And and that it's it's. Uh, I don't want to be flippant about this. Uh, this is uh, very 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 serious. So I can't you know I can't express that enough. You know to get a handle on this, um, to get the confidence that we need, you know, between both sides to be able to discuss this constructively. And I, Thank you very much for, for, for doing this. But please also understand, you know, what we're looking at and from our perspective. And indeed, for all of us to go forward and get this right. Because it's just, uh, you know, once you get up to this level, you're talking about 0.08. I mean, it gets so fuzzy. Um, and on the other side, we're, you know, we're talking about hard tax uh, with punitive damages of 125%. So. And I understand this is, I mean... This is not a theoretical exercise. What we do has real world consequences for, for people's livelihoods and we take that very seriously and we want to do the best science that we can with the best data that we have. And our obligation is, is as scientists to the science and to the data and to do the best job with that that we can. And management takes that science and takes input from stakeholders and tries to come to a way to have, to plan for the long term a sustainable fishery on this species. and. We can't throw our hands up and say, we don't know anything, and so we're going to do nothing. And I think what, what we're trying to do here is, is move this forward as far as the science will let us go with this. And I think maybe this would be a good time to start talking about what we're going to do in the future, um, unless, which I think will address, comes back to sort of how we set the quota. But if there's other questions about how we do it now versus what we plan to do in the future, um, I can take some of those questions now or we can move into what's the future of this assessment and how this is going to play out. Do you mean future within the next month? No. The, well, we then, got, we then got, you're we, done. we got to live for the next 12 months. You know? So, so um, right. So do we have an opportunity to talk about that or is it nothing that's going to happen? It's not right. So we have not, we've barely gotten the survey complete right now. So we're still waiting on commercial data. The assessment is not, we're not, we haven't done no, completed it. No, so in terms of, and the assessment will be a turn of the crank update of what we've always done. So because of the way our process is structured. So we do, and this I guess relates to the benchmark and the research recommendation questions as well, is basically every five years or so, we send this through peer review. So we do, we do all new, not all new stuff. We do, we do, do we address the research recommendations? We work on improving the model. We work on coming to the tweaking the model, you know, moving the science forward. And then we take that to peer review and a panel of outside experts comes in and vets the whole thing. They go over it from, from nose to tail, kick the tires, do everything and tell us whether or not we have done what we have is good enough for management. And so the answer when what comes out is it says either pass or fail. And so if you pass, this is good enough for management. And if you fail, you get, usually you go back to whatever you had the last time around. But they also come out with a list of research recommendations. And that's what can we do the next time around to make this better? So right now we're in the process of, we have the best model that the peer review panel approved and said is good enough for management. And that's what we've been updating over the last five years. It's what we'll update again in a, um, a couple of weeks. And set the quota for this coming spring, winter spring, based on that result. In, if this comes to future work, in 2013, this is gonna go through the SARC process. So we will be addressing, we will be coming up with a new models, we'll be coming up with new reference points, we'll be addressing the research recommendations, and we'll be sending this to peer review to get their stamp of approval on all of the new things that we've done. And it's gonna address, I think, a lot of the concerns of management, of stakeholders, um, and of the previous review panel. Now, is it gonna be perfect? No, but we, 
think it'll be an improvement on what we've got now, and that'll address a lot of the concerns and will help us move management forward for this season.